Gavin Creel, welcome to Cultural Attaché. You don't know this, but you and I have had a relationship for over 20 years. Oh, well, I'm sorry I haven't been more attentive. Well, it's all right, because I have I first saw you in Bat Boy. Oh my, you did not. I did. I saw you in Bat Boy. I've seen you in Thoroughly Modern Millie, Hair, oh Book of Mormon, She Loves Me, Hello Dolly, and Into the Woods, which is the reason we're talking. Yes, you saw Bat Boy. I was only in that for a very short time because of an injury. They brought me in to do four performances. No, for a vacation. They brought me in for four shows. I rehearsed for like a week and a half, and then I was supposed to do two shows Saturday, two shows Sunday, and that was it. And the first day of my rehearsal, the guy broke his hand. And they were like, you're going to be on in three days for an indefinite amount of time. And it was the most unbelievable shot out of a cannon thing. I had so much fun doing that show. I, I, I forgot I even did that show. I love that show, but yeah. it has to be done well for it to work. I've seen a bad production of it. Ooh. And friends thought I was nuts for loving it. And I said, you needed to see it at Union Square Theater. Yeah, it was pretty special there. Caitlin Hopkins is a, a miracle. I, Leslie Kritzer understudied her and ended up finishing the run and just super talented people doing awesome work. Carrie Butler. Awesome. Devin Butler. So cool. And, and Devin May, who I thought yeah. was, was just amazing in that part. A miraculous performance. So good. So where I want to start, Gavin, is with a show I didn't get to see you in, but I later saw a revised version of it. Because in 2003, you were in Stephen Sondheim's Bounce. I was, yes. In Chicago and at the Kennedy Center. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what did you learn from that experience of working on Sondheim's material that perhaps informs the work you're now bringing to Into the Woods? You know what pops to mind is that I watched the greatest, at that time, living musical theater composer and arguably the greatest living producer, director of our musical theater time, Hal Prince. I watched them in the mud. I got to watch them trying to make the lotus blossom, you know? And it, if, if I'm honest, it wasn't successful. Well, obviously it wasn't commercially successful, but it was bumpy. And I got to see them trying to figure out how to tell a story in a way that when you haven't been around I mean, the, he's the greatest ever. So you, I, I did this very foolish, but innocently enough thing of deciding that they must like come out of the womb formed and these, these, these ideas must just be hatched in brilliance. And I was like, oh yeah, this moment isn't really that great. Sondheim can write something that's really not that great. And then Sondheim goes, this is really not that great. How do I make this greater? What if I move this here and do this and then watch it become something that went to the next level and then obviously since went on to a new level. And I got to watch them in process and the greatest people in our industry in process to see that in front of you is very humbling and encouraging and freeing experience. Well, and coming out of Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera, I mean, you have you had to have been pinching yourself that oh you were gosh. in the presence of yes. Oh, you did your research. That's just so nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got my equity card at Pittsburgh CLO in the ensemble. The first summer I was there, I did two summers in a row. The first summer, I auditioned the summer before and didn't get in. And then the next summer I did get in. And we were supposed to do five shows and they spent all this money on the second show, which was La Caja Full and didn't send that many, spelled, sell that many tickets. So then they fired four of us because there wasn't anything for us to do in Gypsy but I already, already got my apartment. So I just stayed and smoked a lot of pot and hung out with the cast. <laughs> and you found your own gimmick. I did, I found my own gimmick, which was, yeah. <laughs> well, and, yeah. And hopefully there are there are people who know what that reference was that, that we just made. Oh yes, if they don't, they are not as close to the musical theater um, gold standard as you or I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so compare the process of working on a musical with Stephen Sondheim to working on one, one of his most successful musicals, arguably his most successful musical, without him any longer? It was sad, I have to say, because James Lapine, on the first day of rehearsal, we all circled up and everybody, and, he, and there was a space next to him. And he said, it's odd to me that there's a space. I feel like Steve made a space for himself or said something beautiful where he was like, this is a bittersweet moment because we're all here to lift this beautiful piece up and I'm honored that you're doing this piece that I wrote, but I wrote it with Steve and Steve would be standing next to me. 
but I have to say, people ask, why do you think this has been such a, there's been such a fever um, that's generated uh, an excitement with this production. And I, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we've all been in so much pain with the pandemic. And this was one of the first new things that came out. It was the first new show of, of last season. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing, and this is sounds woo woo, but I think Steve was guiding us from the other side. I think I still feel like um, a presence and it's, it's like a rock concert response to our show in a way that James was like, I, I don't understand what's happening. It's crazy. I think that that is definitely um, a testament to the show being so beloved for now, almost what, almost 35, almost 40 years. But I also think it's, I think if we were guided, I think there was a spirit on the other side, the best spirit of all going, I'm going to help. And just sort of got into all of our hearts and I'm, I can't wait for LA to see this, this production. I think it's fitting that this stretch of the limited engagement is ending in LA for five weeks at the Amundsen. We're so excited to get there. We're in San Francisco now. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm in San Francisco now. We came a week early so I could enjoy the city. I love this town, but I'm, I love LA and I'm excited to get out there and just share this gift that has been given to all of us with all of Los Angeles. And it feels appropriate that it ends in Los Angeles because the show originated in Southern California. It did it, the Old Globe, did it not? It did, I actually yeah. saw that production. Oh, was that so exciting to see? It was, it was. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps now that you asked me that question, to be honest with you. And it was interesting to see the changes between what I saw in San Diego and what I later saw in New York. Mm -hmm. um, like The Last Midnight wasn't in the show. There was a song called Boom Crunch. Oh, cool. Um, and Steve wrote in his, in his book, and I'm not trying to be pretentious, I did get to know him. Um, amazing which was, uh, yeah, that's a pinch me moment for sure. But, you know, he said in his book, you know, Boom Crunch didn't advance the story, Last Midnight does. And that's why he dropped the song. But you can find it online. Oh, I have to a tape, a, a bootleg of a, a, a bootleg of that or somebody performing it. I, I know I've, I've seen it. Who performed it out of town? Because it wasn't Bernadette, right? It wasn't Bernadette. It, um, I don't remember who was who was the witch. That's so cool. But I also think The Last Midnight has has one of the best lyrics in the entire show. Which is? You're not good, you're not bad, you're just nice. Yeah. I love that lyric. Yeah. that's. I think that's a good way of condemning almost anyone. It really is. <laughs> well, nobody follows it up with, I'm not nice. I'm, uh, I'm not, you're not good, you're not bad, you're just nice. I'm not nice, I'm just right, I'm the witch. I'm just right. I'm not nice. I'm just right. Yeah. You know, whether you want to like me or not, I'm right. Exactly. Oof. Exactly. And it goes by so quickly. You know, all this brilliance packed in. Oh, it's so humbling to, to listen to writing like that. Well, when I saw the show at the St. James in December, it oh. looked to me like everybody was having the time of their lives, which is not easy to do as an actor. I'm married to an actor, so I know. Looking like you're having fun on stage is not is a lot of work. But I'm wondering how much of it is the fact that you guys are all genuinely having a good time. 100%. Like, like you said, it, it is really hard to fake joy in that way. And even if you're doing a really good job of it, the audience can sniff it out. We know, like, that's not real. That's not, you're not really feeling that. I mean, I'm, I'm personally having the time of my life. Like, I did not expect to be a part of this. I was going to go watch my best friend Sarah in the in the concert at City Center and then Lear de Bessonet called me and was just like hey would you ever consider coming in and at first time my ego was like I don't want to play that part and I'm gonna be the baker and then I thought about it I was like no it's 10 days let's just do the job I need the health insurance I'll have a good time I'll get to hang out with Sarah again we had such a good time doing waitress for that small amount of time together and then here I am a, over a year later still getting to tell the story across the country in these incredible cities for these audiences that our Orlando 
We just went to Orlando, and our opening night at Orlando was the loudest crowd that we've had in the entire run of the show. I could not believe it. They stopped and clapped during scenes. Like, Cinderella would say something, and they would, ooh! It was like we were in a pantomime. It was unbelievable. And it it's, it's just a, a joy that people are willing to allow themselves to feel the joy that we do genuinely feel on stage. And now we have this incredible cast led by Stephanie Block and Montego Glover and Sebastian Arcelis and we're just we are literally still having fun and and i can't believe we're, we're this leg of it is going to be done in six weeks it's nuts It'll be sad it's gonna be very sad to let it go but all things must come exactly um well since you mentioned sarah Bareilles, i just had a conversation last week with with jesse mueller and oh, and we were we were talking about how the tradition of an original cast touring a show is something that seems like a relic of an older period. Because I told her that I saw the original cast of Chicago in Los Angeles. I saw mm -hmm. Angela Lansbury and Sweeney Todd in Los Angeles. These are not things that happen any longer. Mm -hmm. It's not like Bette Midler was going to tour the country doing Hello, Dolly. No. Yet most of you have come together to continue telling this story. A good percentage of you who have played this on Broadway. Why, why do you why do you think the mold is broken for Into the Woods? I think the world has changed since what we went through. The pandemic changed me, certainly. I can speak for myself, of just really appreciating what you have in a new way. Um, I just don't think we were ready to let it go. Um, but I, I will say I'm writing a new piece called Walk On Through that I'm really excited about. And... I knew I'd just done this industry presentation in December, and I knew the chances of a production happening in the next six months was slim. I knew it was gonna take time and relationships and raising money and uh, working on the piece more. And I thought, what a gift this person dropped in my lap personally. I could save money, I could work, I could see the country, I could take a breath from everything that we've been through. And then I think that story sort of whispered through the building Gavin's going to go. And I started talking to him. Hey, are you thinking about going? Let me tell you why I'm going. When does this ever happen? We could actually all go together. Our show is definitely closing because New York, New York needed a theater. And we were, had to close. But we didn't feel ready to be finished. And except for Josh Breckenridge, who is one of my dear friends, I did Book of Mormon with on the tour 11 years ago and has done like 100 Broadway shows. He came in and replaced Al, who was our original um, Giant's Foot and Cinderella's father and everything. So we got this gift in Josh to join us, but that is the entire closing company of the show. We bumped some understudies up um, to parts they'd already played, but they were now playing it full time, but it was us. And it made being able to deepen, uh, play, joy, we didn't have to start over. We got to pick up where we left off when we got back in the rehearsal room to stage the tour. And sorry, not the tour. We were like, a, they said, it's not really a tour. It's 10 cities, limited engagement. That's it, going across the country. Um, so we just kept playing and we continue to keep playing. And I think that's why it stays fresh and exciting because everybody in this company trusts one another so implicitly. I also think on the heels of everybody needing to heal, you know, there. There is, I think, one of the ish, one of the main things that Sondheim wanted to get across with this particular work, and he said so in an interview around the time of the release of the film, was that the message of Into the Woods is is about community responsibility, mm -hmm. and there's obviously a sense of community within the Broadway community. There's a sense of community within this company. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this musical offers any insight into how we perhaps can better serve yeah. our, ourselves by coming together as a community in, in, our, in our regular days, in our regular lives? Yes, I think it's two parts, to be honest. Because the whole thing starts with, I wish more than anything, everyone has, everybody, if we can acknowledge that everybody wants something for themselves. Everybody does. If we can acknowledge that everyone wants something, then we can see the shared community in that fact and how wonderful it would be if we could help each other get what each other wants, you know? And this musical lays that out so beautifully. The other, the other thing I was gonna say is when you said that about community, 
no one is alone another level of that lyric sort of hit me in that no one is alone obviously on surface face face value on the surface it seems like it means i'm with you but also i'm with you in helping you get what you want we can work together to help you achieve your dreams and that's you know there's always and the end there's always a force outside of you that's greater than you that is against you in some way that the food chain the giant isn't bad you know giant uh, giant isn't what is that lyric in them giants can be right giants can be good you decide what's right you decide what's good and the idea that everybody's just even the giant is just trying to do what they can do to survive if we can see the community in that statement which is what I think the show really illuminates. And in this conversation, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess it means more than just, you're not alone as in, you don't have to be sad and lonely. It means you're not alone in your, in your desires, your dreams, your wishes, your hopes. I've got them too. So let's, let's both dream together. Right, and as you're saying that, Gavin, I'm thinking about something that John Kander said in his acceptance speech on Sunday, where he, the first thing he did was thank his parents for creating the creating a world where happiness was an option. Yes. It's like, it seems if we had a sense of community, we might have a greater sense of happiness as well. Yeah. Yeah, because we'd be able to see our common desires and wants and needs. And nobody wants to be miserable. Some people are chemically predisposed to that kind of pain in a way that I have sometimes understood, but not as deeply and not as consistently as others but they still are trying to find a way to be peaceful, content, joyful, happy. Uh, I, I, I love that for three hours at the Amundsen, we're going to give people an opportunity to sort of contemplate all of these, all of these ideas and issues. And I just hope that ultimately when you watch the show, I love playing the Prince so very much um, and the Wolf too, but people ask what are my favorite, my favorite parts, my, the Prince is my favorite because I love playing someone who on the surface is the most famous, the richest, the best looking, the best dressed. And everybody, I love playing him so that everybody around him can bow and be like, oh, that ass hat, oh, that guy, here he comes, here he comes. I love that, that the version of the prince I wanted to build, who is just as afraid, doesn't believe he has what it takes to be a king, is so caught up in himself that he can't be objective. And yet in the end, the poor, you know, lentil picking scullery worker and the, the, the kitchen wench as, as her mother, stepmother calls her, teaches him the great lesson of, I want something in between this unbelievable house you had and the horrible house I had. And I just love, I love that I get to play, I get to come out on the stage and make people laugh and and then somebody else comes out and breaks your heart and makes you cry and makes you think. And that's, I think Sondheim and Lapine's being this, being Sondheim's most successful show is it, it comes in the front door, making you think it's one thing while it's simultaneously coming in the back door to surprise you from behind of like, you thought it was just a sweet twee combining all the things and all oh, they all want the things and act two drops the bomb. And it's like, yeah, we're going to keep going. We're actually going to get quite real now. And what do you think of us now? And then we hold their hand at the end and say, the future, pass it on. Children are listening. And that's never been more apparent to me than today. All my friends are sending their kids to college now. And I'm like, when did that happen? And they're raising such beautiful people. My best two best friends have, one has three kids and one has one. And my one friend Catherine's kids are twins, identical twins. They were born when we were doing Thoroughly Modern Millie, right after Thoroughly Modern Millie. I held them in my arms premature. And now it sounds like, a, you know, but it's real to me in a whole new way that now they're going, they're each going to a different college in Boston. And my best friend Celia's son is eight years old. And I think in 10 years, he's going to be doing what these boys are doing. And 10 years ago, he didn't exist. So it's like, what? You know, well, and we're having this conversation on the same afternoon that I'm going to my goddaughter's high school graduation. And what does that feel like? I remember holding her when she was, you know, smaller than my iPhone. I mean, not really, but 
Isn't Zyphos have gotten so big that. And I know. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? It is crazy. It is crazy. But, you know, that's a good thing. That's a good kind of crazy. And, and also we get we get to be together in artistic ways, in new conversations about art, about life. We get to reflect and we also get to laugh. And and I also think some this is a question I get asked a lot in interviews is why do you think it's so powerful and so relevant is the front door back door thing. I think it comes in with stories that we've it's we don't even realize these fairy tales are part of our DNA. They taught us how to not be greedy, how to be kind, how to be we've got these fairy tale made up characters in our head, princes and castles and and damsels in distress and witches and giants and all this stuff. But what they were really told to us is Jack was greedy and there was a circumstance and a consequence for his greediness. Um, Little Red ate all the sweets and was, you know, um, self-serving and then this lascivious, but then her grandmother taught her how to fight back and feminist power and like all these tiny little things that are huge things. They're not tiny at all. And it's not lost on me doing the show eight times a week. Well, I do want to ask you, you 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 talked a little bit about the character of, of Cinderella's prince, but I love casting one actor as the wolf and one and the same actor as the prince, because I think there's a real common conversation that goes on between those two characters that upends our ideas of what a wolf is and what a prince is. Mm -hmm. And that I assume that that has to give you a tremendous opportunity as an actor. Well, my gosh, the next time I do it, I'm going to play it with a new idea in my head because I love that. Um, I tried to find the commonalities and also the differences in a way because as an actor, I want to be able to come on. My, I'm very physical in the way I perform and I was excited about the, the, the physical posture of the wolf. And yet in the, in the um, costume sketch by our, our wonderful costume designer, Andrea uh, Hood, it just said, it said Dapper Dan. He had a cane in the costume sketch, which they, it was just in the sketch. And I went in the room and I was like, should I have a cane? And they were like, sure, if you want. I said, well, let's, yeah, let's do it. Um, but he has a little waistcoat and a, a fur coat and all this. And I just sort of thought he's had all these victims. He's eaten all these people. And I feel like the, he started hunched over. And as he ate, he was like, I want to be greater than my so he stole the watch, the pocket watch, and the bow tie, and he had all different victims. And he knows now how to walk on two legs to, to pretend and to act as much like a human so he can get his prey. I just love the physicality of it. And it, what's neat about the prince is everything is so upright, but all he wants is to slump. He's just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to be a king. That's my prince anyway. So he puffs up everywhere he goes. But deep down, I just think he's a lost little boy <laughs> yeah and the, and and the wolf as as designed in this production feels like he's turned himself into a bit of a dandy yes 100 percent yeah now let me ask you about something you told Ke kevin sesum six years ago <sighs> okay <laughs> which is i also think musical theater gets a shitty rep do you oh, yeah. yeah why i mean it i know i, I think Maybe I'm coming from the position of having loved it since I was first exposed to it, but. Yes, but we were exposed early in a way that the internet now, it's just, I, I think that was six years ago. Um, I think it's improving because of the access to the internet and people can see things and bootlegs like them or not are reaching people that wouldn't normally be able to afford to go to Broadway show in New York or at national tours and coming through towns. But I do think there it's, it's less so, it's gotten cooler in a mainstream way than I ever thought it would. I think it has to do with crossover artists like Sarah Bareilles who come from the pop world and write a musical that everybody loves. And um, I think it has to do with theater people I'm seeing more on TV, like the Gilded Age is a, 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 it's a cornucopia of musical theater actor delights and you get to see, oh yeah, they're all amazing actors and they can rise to the occasion in a way that when I was coming up, it was like pat the musical theater people on the head. You don't get TV shows because you don't know how to act when you're in front of a camera. Um, maybe there's some technical things that we all need to learn to shift. Like certainly I've watched film and TV people come on stage and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> you don't understand. It's not the same. Just like I don't understand as well as they do what it's like to be in front of a camera. But the heart of it is the same. I think musical theater 
when I was coming up in college, I graduated in 1998. It was like the bastard children of acting, singing, and dancing. You're not a real dancer, so you're musical theater. You're not a real actor, you're not a singer. And I just don't think that's the case anymore. So I think I might amend it to say, thanks to young people who are passionate about it, getting excited the way that we did in the privacy of our own homes with LPs and, you know, great performances on PBS. Now they're able to, there's great performances and not so great performances all over the internet of 10 of the same performance of the same show from eight different angles of people on their iPhones that shouldn't be filming, you know. But I, I say the more people that can be exposed to theater, the better. I, with the AI thing that's all coming about, some people are, I was talking to our, one of our people in the company and they were worried about like, well, what's gonna stop them from making holograms like and, and having people? And I said, I want them to, but there's no substituting it, an organic living, breathing human being for a hologram. I think it'd be really cool to see a stage full of holograms, but we're, I, am, I firmly believe we as human beings don't wanna watch a bunch of holograms on the stage for every show, maybe one or two, maybe a few, maybe there's new technologies we don't even know yet. But I think, and I don't think this is naive to say, I think theater is on the precipice of a huge renaissance as AI and artificial um, entertainment and stuff grows and grows and grows. We're gonna be hungry for people who can just stand in front of me and break my heart, sweating, spitting, crying, cracking, you know, being human. I completely agree with you because you can't replace that. No. You can't replace that. I know people who saw the ABBA hologram show in London, and I know people who loved it and people who hated it. So yes, yeah. I don't like ABBA enough to do that. So oh, I, I would go see it, but um, I don't know that new record. It's a new record they do on hologram, right? I don't even know what that show is. It's, it's you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's like at this point, do I want to go see you two re redo an album tour that they did 35 years ago when I saw them when they were young and hungry? Not really. It's yeah. just, just where, where, where my brain is. Sure. I'd rather Would have you, something there's, new. There's something new. There's something out there for everybody. I just stand really excited as, as people, some people are panicking about AI as far as theater goes. I do think in the next 20, 30 years, if I'm still performing, how old will I be? Oof. Oh, you, could still be, you could still look at Cheetah. I know. What a star. I mean, I, I look at Bet. Bet. Bet's not as old as Cheetah, obviously, but Bet was 72. She's what, she, she close to 76, 77 now. Still kick, kicking ass. But um, Which is approximately where you'll be in 40 years. Yeah, about this. Yeah, 30, 40 years, 30, 30, years. 30 years from now, I'll be 77. And I'm like, if I'm lucky enough to be alive still, if the world hasn't imploded, you know, but... I don't know. I love, did you see Station Eleven, the TV show? I did not. It's, it's, it's real. I found it very fascinating. I love sci-fi and I love the, the post-apocalyptic, like hope. Will we, will we rise up out of it? Will hope carry us on? And it's beautifully shot and storytelling. But one of the great pieces of that, I'm not giving anything spoiler or anything, but there's a troop of theater players who kind of go around from, from like, commune to commune of the survivors of the apocalypse, of the disease. I think it was a disease that went around. Um, and they're just with a wagon and some curtains and make, makeup and and they're just tell, doing Shakespeare for people. And I'm like, right, we've been telling stories around fires for as long as we can remember. We will tell them if it's just a fire and, um, you know, a couple stones you can hit together to make a sound and we will not stop. I love I love that about what we do. Now, since we discussed something new, um, people in Los Angeles will get a chance if they go to the Hotel Cafe. Yes. To, oh, to see, you, walk on you. through Confessions of a Museum Novice. Yeah. And you've been working on this for a while and you've been performing it off and on in different places. How has the work evolved since you first started sharing this with the world? Thank you for saying this and for bringing it up. I really appreciate it. It continues to evolve. I can't say where, but we're about to make a big announcement. We're gonna be doing a production in the fall in New York City. I'm so thrilled. What we're gonna do in LA is we're gonna do the first like 45 minutes of the show to give people a taste. And then we're gonna do some covers, theater and pop covers to give people some stuff they know. Um, I have a little band we started called The Cuffs. My music director and guitar player from Walk On Through and I, um, we just 
started a band. When we were in Chicago, we did we did this concert in Chicago at the City Winery, and I stood on stage and I said, this is their inaugural Cuffs um, performance. We just get together and play acoustic versions and re reimagined versions of songs and, and share some original stuff too. But I, I, I've i evolved Walk On Through. From originally it was, I was invited to come have a meeting with uh, Limor Tomer and Aaron Flannery at the Met, who run the Met Live Arts series. Limor still runs it. Aaron has moved on to an uh, opera in Wisconsin, Minnesota. I can't remember which state she's in. Um, anyway, she they they said, would you like to come to the Met? We'll give you a membership card, have at the museum, look around, and when you find a piece of art or artwork, pieces, anything, anything that you're inspired by within the building, let us know and we'll help you produce a show for one night at the Met. And it was such, I'd never been there. I was an imposter syndrome times a million. I did not, I'm not a huge fine art person. Museums tend to overwhelm me, but I went for it and we presented it. We were supposed to present it in June of 2020 and obviously the pandemic had other ideas. We ended up doing it in October of 2021 with a fully masked audience for two shows and it was electric. And after that, I was like, I have to turn this into a musical. I have to expand this a bit. It's still, I still play Gavin Creel. I still, it's still about a, a man who's having a sort of a midlife meltdown, who's for some reason called to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to try to figure his life out by walking through and figuring out what's going on. It's about love and life and art and loneliness and ultimately forgiveness and love again. So I, I'm really excited. Are you gonna be able to come? I'm that is on my schedule, so I would I love for you to be there. To... Yeah, I, I'd love to get the word out to as many people because we'd love to pack it. We we sold out in Chicago, and it was so thrilling to have that many people listening without any of the set, lighting, costumes, anything. Um, projections. We had a couple little projections because we we the art is the major star of the show. We we actually the Met is in total collaboration with us on this and has given us rights and access to the artists that are living. They've given us permissions. It's just thrilling. And the hope is that we're going to do an off-Broadway run and transfer to Broadway and do a run there. And then I want to take, I personally want to take it all across the world to every major market and just share the story of how art can be so intimidating and so healing. Well, I think we know what you'll be doing for the next few years. You better believe it. If I have my way, that's what we're going to be doing. Well, good. Well, since we're with you. Yeah, well, I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. And I love the Hotel Cafe. It's a great space. No, wait, I never played it. Sarah was the one who's like, that's where I got my start. You got to go out and play there. And I was like, so we're so happy to be there. Well, before I let you go, I have to ask you about something old since we just talked about something new. I'm going to take you back 17 years ago to when Good Time Nation came out. Oh, yeah. And you sang on there about what might still happen. Yeah. That was 17 years ago. What has you most optimistic about what might still happen to you personally and professionally? Oh, this is such a good question. Thank you so much. It's such a beautiful interview. Thank you're you. So, you're so good at this. This is so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know what? We wrote that song on the roof of my studio apartment, 250 square feet. Some of the hardest and happiest times I've had. And one of the best lessons of living in New York in 250 square feet is you have everything you need in that much space. Anything past that is icing. I have a two bedroom apartment, thank God now, but I could live in 250 square feet if you made me. I'm like, yeah, I could sell it all and just chill. But we would crawl up to the roof illegally up because the, the, it didn't shut, the, uh, the fire door didn't shut. And we would sit up there and put a blanket down. And my buddy, Robbie Roth and I, who I made my first two records with, um, we'd pick around with the melodies and that song is ultimately about heartbreak, but like it's it's hope. Um, the pain and possibility of, and, and perspective, being on the roof, um, climb up to the top of it, gotta find a brand new place to lie. Some days it's a pile of shit and you find your mind completely dry. Get up above the rooftops, boy, you gotta find Get up above the rooftops, boy. Better find it. Oh, I can't remember the lyric. I haven't sang the song in so long. There's always a kind of joy right after the gray, the gray skies have gone. God, I, I love writing lyrics. I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> but like, I wrote that as a kid. I was 26 when I wrote those lyrics, 27. 
20 years ago, I wrote that song. And it was a, it was a call to my future self. Oh, it makes me emotional to think about like I was singing, it was almost like Joni with both sides now, you know, like her writing, how could she know to write that? I'm not comparing that, that song, is <laughs> but like the idea of being a young person and feeling really sad, but saying there's good stuff coming, keep going. That's, that's kind of what Rock, Walk On Through is about. It's like, you can't know the future. So just sit in the present, just be, be. Get yourself a little bit of, get a beer, get a friend, get a guitar, get on the roof, look out over the city. There's possibility everywhere. And I mean, I got to tell you, not to bring it back to Into the Woods, but I was pretty broken as we all were, but I'll speak for myself. I was really, really broken before the pandemic, through the pandemic and after it was just a terrible time in my life. And I can say Into the Woods was like this beautiful, life raft that not only buoyed me out of storm but it continues to lift me and set me down on solid ground and i will never forget this time that i've had and i just hope that we pack the houses at the amundsen because i want to go out with a bang i, I know we will we will i have no doubt that you will and i look forward to our 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 20-year relationship continuing I can't wait. I cannot wait. Thank you for this wonderful interview. This has been a joy.